Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing depression and the antidepressant drugs. Okay, right, so we're currently in the process of discussing lithium as a mood stabilizer used in the treatment of bipolar disorder. Okay, right, uh, so it isn't understood how lithium works to combat um, bipolar disorder. However, what is understood about what lithium does is on the level of the GQ-11 mediated pathway, so it's this pathway that we're discussing now. So there are a number of G-protein coupled receptors which are going to activate GQ-11 heterotrimeric G proteins, which are heterotrimeric G proteins where this alpha subunit is alpha Q slash 11. It's one of the alpha Q slash 11 family of alpha subunits. Okay, so to give examples of uh, receptors, G protein coupled receptors, which uh, activate GQ slash 11 heterotrimeric G proteins. Uh, some of the adrenaline receptors um, which will respond to noradrenaline are G protein coupled receptors which activate this form of heterotrimeric G protein. So for instance the alpha 1A adrenergic receptor, the alpha 1B adrenergic receptor and the alpha 1D adrenergic receptor, all of those are separate G protein coupled receptors which will activate GQ-11 heterotrimeric G proteins. In addition you have five receptors for, sorry, three receptors for 5-HT, uh, which will uh, activate GQ-11 heterotrimeric G proteins. So these are the 5-HT2A receptor, the 5-HT2B receptor, and also the 5-HT2C receptor. So some of the receptors uh, for uh, monoamines that we've discussed uh, a lot in this video uh, are G-protein coupled receptors which activate heterotrimeric G-proteins of this family. Okay, so let me talk about the activation of those heterotrimeric G-proteins. So let's go over the page here. So. Uh, let's say that our G-protein coupled receptor has now had its ligand molecule bind to it and it's now going to change in conformation so that the heterotrimeric G-protein can now bind to it. Now I'm going to draw the G-protein coupled receptor in a different way now. Okay, so all I'm doing is spinning it around 180 degrees from where I have uh, shown it previously. Okay, So the amino terminus I've now moved to this side over here and the carboxylic acid terminus I've moved over here. That is simply to get the carboxylic acid terminus out of the way. Okay, now, once uh, the G-protein coupled receptor has had its ligand bind to it, what will happen is you'll get a conformational change, particularly on the level of the free intracellular loops here, shown here in orange. So the free intracellular loops are going to change in conformation, and now they're going to make available a binding site for the alpha subunit of a GQ-11 heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, so this is some G alpha Q slash 11 alpha subunit here binding to the intracellular loops of this activated G protein coupled receptor. Now it's still got its lipid moiety, so I'll show that here, okay, which is still attaching it to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bi there. Okay, and it will still also have its beta and its gamma subunit bound here. Okay, so here's the beta subunit, and here's the gamma subunit and they'll also have the lipid moiety attached to the gamma subunit here. Okay, so let's colour this in. So we'll have the alpha subunit here in red, okay, and then we'll have the beta subunit in blue, okay, and the gamma subunit in green. Okay, right. Now, the beta and the gamma complex does not bind to the G protein coupled receptor. Okay. Um, however, it is important for the binding of the alpha subunit to the intracellular loops of the G protein coupled receptor. Indeed, if the alpha subunit does not have the beta gamma complex bound to it, then it cannot bind to the intracellular loops of the G protein coupled receptor. So this is utterly essential for the binding of the alpha subunit to the G protein coupled receptor. 
Now, uh, before the heterotrimeric G protein bounds to the G protein coupled receptor, the alpha subunit was bound to the GDP very, very tightly. Okay, there was not a chance that the alpha subunit was going to let go of the alpha sub. Uh, sorry, was going to let go of the GDP. Okay. However, once the alpha subunit has bound to the G protein coupled receptor, it loses uh, the tight bond between itself and the guanosine diphosphate. So this bond becomes much weaker, and now the guanosine diphosphate is going to fall away from the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein. Okay. And then what will happen is it will get replaced by a guanosine triphosphate molecule because GTP is far uh, more present in the cytoplasm than GDP. So you've got very low concentrations of GDP in the cytoplasm, much higher concentrations of GTP. So just by probability, it's going to be replaced by GTP, not GDP. Okay, right. Now, when GTP binds to the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein, the alpha subunit is going to change in conformation, and it's going to cleave away from the beta-gamma complex, because once the alpha subunit has GTP bound, once it's in the on state, it no longer binds to the beta-gamma complex. Okay, So it's going to release the beta-gamma complex, so this is going to go off. It'll still be attached to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer by the lipid moiety here, but it's no longer attached to the alpha subunit. Now, what did I tell you? In order for the alpha subunit to bind to the G protein coupled receptor here, okay, it needed to have the beta gamma complex bound to it. Without the beta gamma complex, the alpha subunit is now also going to cleave away from the G protein coupled receptor. So the alpha subunit, now with GTP bound to it, is going to go off on its own little adventure, still attached to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, but now on its own. Okay, right. So here we now have our alpha Q slash 11 um, subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, here it is, and it will now have guanosine triphosphate GTP bound to it. Okay, now, this alpha subunit is now going to go off and activate uh, phospholipase C enzymes of the beta type. Okay, so I'll show this here. So here is a phospholipase C enzyme of the beta type. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about phospholipase C enzymes. So, phospholipase C enzymes, there are 13 different genes for phospholipase C enzymes, and each of these genes has multiple different splice variants. Okay, but we'll just talk about the different genes. So, phospholipase C enzymes, often abbreviated to PLC enzymes. Okay, so, um, the first family then, well, the phospholipase C enzymes are grouped into families, is the first thing to say. The first family of phospholipase C enzymes is the phospholipase C beta family of enzymes, and this contains four genes. It contains phospholipase C beta 1, phospholipase C beta 2, phospholipase C beta 3, and phospholipase C beta 4. Okay? The next family of phospholipase C enzymes is the phospholipase C gamma family, which contains two different genes, phospholipase C gamma 1 and phospholipase C gamma 2. Next up is the phospholipase C delta family, which contains three genes, phospholipase C delta 1, phospholipase C delta 3, and phospholipase C delta 4. Okay. Next up, we've got the phospholipase C epsilon family, which contains just one gene, the phospholipase C epsilon 1. And then we've got the phospholipase C eta family. Okay, so we're getting more and more crazy Greek letters here. Okay, eta is this sort of strange N-like symbol here. So this is eta if you want to go away and Google it. Phospholipase C eta 1 and phospholipase C eta 2 exist. And then we're going even worse with the Greek symbols. Phospholipase C zeta is the next one. Okay, which is the same symbol used for the zeta function in maths, which is the function associated with the a million pounds um, problem of the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, and uh, there is only one gene there, phospholipase C zeta 1. Okay, and that takes up to 13, I hope. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 
10, 11, 12, 13. Excellent. Now, the ones that we are interested in is this family here. The proteins that are produced by these four genes, and they, some of them will have multiple splice variants. Okay, so the phospholipase C beta family of phospholipase C enzymes. And by the way, all the 13 of them, okay, all 13 genes produce proteins which catalyze the same reaction, okay? Phospholipase C enzymes all catalyze the same reaction. What differs between the different families is how they're activated. And the phospholipase C beta family of phospholipase C enzymes are going to be activated by alpha Q slash 11 proteins. Okay, right. Now, this has just reminded me of something that I meant to tell you right at the start of this video, which is that I made a mistake with regards to the beta subunits of heterotrimeric G proteins. This splice variant here, G beta 5, that I called it, I called it G beta 5 5, that is actually an S, not G beta 5 5. It's G beta 5 S. Okay, so the small one and the large one, basically. Okay, so that's just a minor correction there. Okay, right. I'm sure that was having you on the edge of your seats. Right, so, um, we're talking about phospholipase C beta family of enzymes then. Now, these enzymes, they are attached to the underside of the phospholipid bile there, but they are continuously in a flux between being attached to the underside of the phospholipid bile there and being in the cytoplasm. So what do I mean by that? I mean that these enzymes can attach to components within the uh, cell membrane, okay? But they don't always have to be attached to those components. They can drop off the underside of the cell membrane and sit within the cytoplasm for a while, and then they can attach back onto the underside of the cell membrane. So they're continuously moving between these two positions. Only the ones that are currently attached to the underside of the cell membrane can be activated by on alpha Q slash 11 proteins. So on state alpha Q slash 11 proteins can bind to phospholipase C beta enzymes that are attached to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, like so. And then they will activate the phospholipase C beta enzymes. Okay, so I should stress that no matter whether the phospholipase C beta enzyme is attached to the cell membrane or whether it's just in the cytoplasm, it's inactive. Okay, so attaching to the cell membrane doesn't activate it. It just is changing its position, so it's just continuously moving about, basically. It can either be bound to something in the cell membrane and therefore dangling to the, on the underside of the cell membrane, but it's still inactive, okay, it still requires activation, okay, it's just only those ones which are attached to the underside of the cell membrane can actually be activated by alpha Q slash 11 uh, proteins in the on state. Okay, right, so now our phospholipase C B enzyme is going to become active. Now, what does pho do phospholipase C enzymes catalyze? Well, they all catalyze the same reaction. Okay, and it's the breakdown of a component of the cell membrane. Okay, and the component of the cell membrane that they're going to break down is something with the rather fantastic name phosphatidyl inositol 1, uh, sorry, not 145, 45, okay, bisphosphate. Okay, and for short, phosphatidyl inositol. 4,5-bisphosphate is uh, usually abbreviated down to PI, okay, for phosphatidyl inositol. So the phosphatidyl here is shortened to P, okay. The inositol here is shortened to I, okay. And then you can either just put P2, like so, okay, uh, for the P is for phosphate, and then the 2 indicates that it's a bisphosphate, okay? Or, if you're being slightly more correct, you can actually specify where those two phosphate groups are. So you can put PI for phosphatidylinositol, and then you can put brackets 4,5P2, PI 4,5P2, 
Okay, if you put just PIP2 or PIP2, people will know what you mean, okay? You don't need to specify where the phosphate groups are. If you were talking about something like phosphatidylinositol 2 free bisphosphate, then you would have to specify because that's a really odd one, okay? However, this is the normal one. This is the one of ghastly importance in molecular biology, okay? So if you omit the information of where the two phosphate groups are, people will assume that they are on the fourth and the fifth uh, carbons of the inositol ring. Okay, right. So, let me tell you about the structure of this molecule then. Okay, it is a component of the cell membrane. It is a phospholipid. Okay, so let me tell you about its structure. So, in order to understand its structure, we first thing need to understand this bit. Phosphatidyl. Okay, now that what that means is that in your structure, you are going to contain the molecule phosphatidic acid. Okay, so we'll start off with the structure of phosphatidic acid, and then we'll see how we can turn it into phosphatidyl inositol. Okay, so phosphatidic acid then to start off with. Okay, phosphatidic acid consists of a glycerol molecule. Okay, which I'm going to highlight in green here. Okay, so this vertical line that I'm colouring in in green here, this is a glycerol molecule. Okay, now the um, proper name for glycerol, the chemist's name for glycerol, is propane 1, 2, 3, trial. Okay, glycerol is the old name for propane 1, 2, 3, trial. Now, propane 1, 2, 3, trial, it's a more of a mouthful, certainly, than glycerol, but it's a more useful name because, again, it tells us exactly what this molecule actually is. It tells us that it's a free carbon molecule where you have alcohol groups coming off the first, the second, and the third carbons. Okay, now, in phosphatidic acid, what you're going to do is attach things onto the alcohol groups that come off the first, the second, and the third carbons of the glycerol molecule. Onto the alcohol group that comes off the first and the second carbon of the glycerol molecule, you are going to attach long-chain carboxylic acids, okay? Which is the more correct name for fatty acids. Okay, now I've, we've already seen an example of a fatty acid. We saw palmitic acid. Okay, now that pretty much illustrates the principles of what a fatty acid is. It's a carboxylic acid molecule with an extremely long chain, basically, which is generally very hydrophobic and therefore doesn't interact well with water. Okay, so you're going to take very long chain fatty acids similar to palmitic acid, okay, but there are many others other than palmitic acid, and you're going to attach them to the alcohol groups that come off the first and the second carbon of the glycerol molecule. So you're going to take two of these long chain carboxylic acids and they're going to be esterified onto the alcohol groups that come off the first and the second carbons of the glycerol molecule. Okay, and another thing I should stress is that these two long chain carboxylic acids that you're going to put here do not need to be the same one. So you could have palmitic acid here and maybe another one here. So maybe stearic acid, okay, instead of palmitic acid. Stearic acid is another example of a long chain carboxylic acid. It's an 18 carbon fully saturated carboxylic acid, what would now be called octa decanoic acid. Now, onto the um, third alcohol group of the glycerol molecule, you are going to attach a phosphate group, okay? So here, this is going to be a phosphate group. Okay, right, and that structure now, that is phosphatidic acid, okay? So it's glycerol with two long chain carboxylic acids here, and then a phosphate group attached onto the alcohol group of the third carbon of the glycerol molecule. Now, to turn this into phosphatidyl inositol, what you're going to do is stick onto the phosphate group an inositol ring. Okay, so we now need to talk about what inositol actually is. Okay, so again, inositol is the old name for a molecule that now has a better name. Okay, the better name for inositol is cyclohexane 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, hexol. Okay, now you can understand why people just call it inositol. Okay, now, again, 
This may be a mouthful, but it's a useful name because it tells us exactly what inositol is, whereas inositol doesn't. This tells us that we are dealing with a six carbon molecule, that's hexane, it's in a cycle, that's the cyclo, and off every single one of the carbons of the six-membered ring, you're going to have an alcohol group. Okay, so let's draw the cyclohexane ring, and I'll do this in skeletal form here. So, literally, to draw a cyclohexane ring, you just draw a pentagon, because you don't show carbon atoms, and you don't show hydrogen atoms coming off carbon atoms. So you, that's all you need to show. Okay, you've got your six carbon atoms, and then the other groups coming off them will just be hydrogen, so you don't show those. So this is cyclohexane. We now want to add alcohol groups onto every single one of the carbons in cyclohexane. Now, you might think, oh, how simple, but there's a subtlety here, okay? And the subtlety, once again, is optical isomerism, okay? Because if you imagine that the ring, this six-membered ring, is sitting within the plane of the piece of paper, off every single one of the carbons, one of the bonds is going to come out of the page towards us at this sort of an angle, and the other is going to go into the page away from us at this sort of an angle. Okay, so you have to decide, do you want the alcohol group that is going to come off every single carbon to come out of the page towards us, and then the hydrogen that comes off every single carbon to go into the page away from us, or do you want it the other way around? And you have to do that for every single carbon. Okay, so this actually does have many optical isomers. Okay, there are actually nine optical isomers of inositol. Okay, now, just as in the case of amino acids, where there was only one, amine, uh, well, one optical isomer of each amino acid used in cells, there is only one optical isomer of inositol actually used in cells. And this isomer of inositol that's used is known as myo-inositol. So let me now show you uh, the structure of myo-inositol. So I'm going to show whether the alcohol groups are coming out of the page or going into the page for each carbon. I won't show the hydrogens, but that will be obvious from where the alcohol groups are coming. So off this carbon here, we're going to have an alcohol group coming out of the page towards us, and therefore the hydrogen off this carbon will be going into the page away from us. Off this second carbon here, we're going to have the alcohol group coming out of the page towards us again, and therefore the hydrogen is going into the page away from us. Off this third carbon here, we're going to have the alcohol group going out of the page towards us, okay, and again the hydrogen will be going into the page away from us. Off the fourth carbon, it finally changes. The alcohol group is going to go into the page away from us, and therefore the hydrogen will be coming out of the page towards us. Off the fifth carbon, it goes back to the way it was before. The alcohol group is going to be coming out of the page towards us, and the hydrogen going into the page away from us. And then off this final one over here, the alcohol group is going to go into the page away from us. Okay, so this is myo-inositol. This is the specific optical isomerism of myo-inositol. Okay, now the carbons in myo-inositol have uh, a naming system. Excuse me. This carbon here is the first carbon. This one here is the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. And you might wonder why is he stressing this so much? I, I didn't draw the structure of these. I didn't draw the structure of glycerol. I didn't draw the structure of the phosphate group. Why am I showing you the exact optical isomerism of inositol here? Well, I think this is very important in understanding why this molecule here is going to be called phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. I am going to explain to you why this is not 3,4-bisphosphate, okay, but we'll come to that. Okay, so, this is the inositol ring then, okay? So, to create phosphatidylinositol, what you do is you attach the inositol ring to the phosphate group here, using the alcohol group that comes off the first carbon of the inositol ring here. So I'm going to put the inositol ring in here, and I'm just going to show it as a blue hexagon. Okay, so the first carbon is the one that's attached to the phosphate group. Now, to create phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate, what you then have to do is stick phosphate groups off the alcohol group of the fourth carbon and also of the fifth carbon. Okay, so we can do this in the picture. 
just like so. We've got the phosphate group now coming off the fourth carbon here and the fifth carbon here. And that now is phosphatidylinositol, 4,5-bisphosphate. Now, if I had just drawn that picture to you, wouldn't you, well, I hope you would question, why is that not called phosphatidylinositol 3 4 bisphosphate? Why is that not deemed the third carbon? Okay, and I hope you now understand that there is a difference between the fifth carbon and the third carbon. Okay, the third carbon, its alcohol group is sitting on the same side as the alcohol group that comes off one of the carbons that sits next to it, okay, and it's sitting on the opposite side to the alcohol group of the other carbon that sits next to it. Whereas the fifth carbon is sitting in between two carbons which have alcohol groups going off in the opposite direction to the direction which its alcohol group goes off in. Okay, so there is a very subtle difference between the third carbon and the fifth carbon. I mean, just look at that, and then look at that. They are not identical, okay? So there is a difference between the third and the fifth carbon, okay? So this is the fifth carbon, it's this one, not this one. Okay, so that is why this molecule is called phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate and not phosphatidyl inositol 3,4-bisphosphate. Phosphatidyl inositol 3,4-bisphosphate exists, but it's nowhere near as important as 4,5-bisphosphate, uh, and its role is very different. Okay, right. Uh, so, this is a phospholipid, okay? So to put this back in this picture up here, it is part of the phospholipid by there. It's not a common phospholipid, okay? There are phospholipids in the phospholipid by there that are much more common than PIP2, okay? But it is present in the phospholipid by there. So you'll have some of these molecules making up the phospholipid by there. So here in green is the glycerol molecule. Okay, here are the long chain carboxylic acids, okay, making up the hydrophobic core of the phospholipid by there. Okay, then in purple we have the phosphate groups, and in blue we have the inositol ring. Okay, so here is a PIP2 molecule in the phospholipid by there. Okay, now what's going to happen then is phospholipase C enzymes of all 13 types, okay, but particularly we're interested in phospholipase C beta family enzymes, they are going to cleave the bond between the glycerol molecule and the phosphate group here, okay, once activated, of course. Okay, now that produces two products. One of the products is a glycerol molecule with two long chain carboxylic acids bound to it as shown here. Okay, this molecule is known as diacylglycerol. Okay, and for short, diacylglycerol is abbreviated to DAG. And this remains within the phospholipid by there once it's been produced. The other product falls off the phospholipid by there because it's dangling into the cytoplasm. Okay, and this is the inositol molecule, specifically the myo-inositol molecule, with three phosphate groups bound to it here. Okay, so here in pink, these are the three phosphate groups, and here in blue, this is our myo-inositol ring. Okay, so this molecule is known as inositol 145-trisphosphate. Okay, right. And for short, inositol 145-trisphosphate is usually abbreviated down to I for inositol, P for phosphate, and then because we've got three phosphate groups, it's IP3. Okay, so there's the inositol, and then we've got the three phosphate groups. Okay, that's the IP3. Right, now both of these molecules have extremely important signaling roles, okay? IP3 goes on to act on IP3 receptors which sit in the ER membrane. It causes them to open, and when they open, they have a calcium channel which spans the ER membrane and releases calcium from the ER. 
diacylglycerol goes on to help in the activation of protein kinase C enzymes, which also generally require calcium ions to activate. So the calcium released by uh, IP3 works with diacylglycerol to activate protein kinase C. So these signaling pathways are extremely important. Now, how do you turn this signaling pathway off? And how do you rebuild PIP2? Okay, because if we just use this pathway without rebuilding PIP2, you're not going to, um, you're, well, you're going to run out of PIP2 in the membrane. Okay, so, firstly, let me describe how we rebuild PIP2, and then I'll tell you about how we degrade IP3. Okay, so, let me get another piece of paper. Okay, so... How do we rebuild PIP2? Well, the way that you build PIP2 is you start with phospholipid acid, which is a very present phospholipid within the phospholipid bilayer. So you have a lot of phospholipid acid in the phospholipid bilayer. So remember, phospholipid acid consists of the two long chain carboxylic acids with the glycerol molecule and the phosphate group. Then what you do is you take an inositol molecule. Okay, and you bind the inositol molecule onto the phosphatidic acid molecule. Okay, so first up, the first step is you start with phosphatidic acid. Okay, phosphatidic acid, phosphatidic acid, phos, whoops, that's not right, phosphatidic acid. Okay, then you add it onto inositol. Okay, now what does this create? Well, this creates phosphatidylinositol, okay, PI. And then what you do is you phosphorylate the phosphatidylinositol, okay? So you stick phosphate groups onto the fourth carbon and then the fifth carbon to create PIP2, okay? So by phosphorylating phosphatidylinositol, you get back to PIP2, okay? Like so. So that's how you return the... Uh, PIP2 in the membrane by using phosphatidic acid, which you have a huge amount of in the membrane, and adding inositol molecules onto it, and then phosphorylating the inositol molecules. Now, the key th thing here is that you require inositol. Now, inositol needs to be recycled, okay? You can't get more inositol into the brain, okay? Well, it's very difficult to get more inositol into the brain because of the blood-brain barrier, okay? So really, in neurons, what needs to happen is the IP3, okay, um, that has been produced in this pathway, okay, needs to be degraded back to inositol so that the inositol can be used to rebuild uh, the PIP2 molecules. Okay, so basically, the way that you get the inositol is by degrading this back again to produce inositol so that it can be recycled, okay, because you can't really get any more, okay, so what happens within the cell then is if we draw a picture of IP3, okay, firstly what happens is you remove the phosphate group from the um, fifth carbon of the IP3 molecule. Okay, so let's just colour this in. So here are the phosphate groups on the first, the fourth, and the fifth carbons of the inositol ring. Okay, in the degradation slash recycling pathway, what happens is firstly, the phosphate group off the fifth carbon is removed, okay, to produce you inositol 1,4-bisphosphate. Okay, let's put this here. So here is our inositol molecule in blue here, okay, and here are the two phosphate groups off the first and the fourth carbons. Okay, now, let's just put a few abbreviations here. The, oft, the, the abbreviation that's often used for IP3 is inositol, that's the INS, 145P3. Okay, this one here then would be INS for inositol, and then it would be 14P2. Okay, so this is the first carbon, this is the fourth carbon. Then what generally happens is that the phosphate group on the first carbon is removed. Okay, and this creates inositol just with a single phosphate group coming off the fourth carbon here. Okay, like so. 
and here's the inositol in blue. And this we could abbreviate down to INS for inositol and then 4P. And then this finally is then just broken down to inositol which can then be used to reproduce PIP2. Okay now each one of these steps is catalyzed by enzymes. So this step is catalyzed by an enzyme, this step is catalyzed by an enzyme, and this step is catalyzed by an enzyme. Lithium inhibits the enzyme that catalyzes this step and this step. Okay, so lithium will stop these two steps. Lithium stops these. Okay, right. So what does this mean? This means that you can do this first step, you can degrade the IP3, which means you can turn off the signaling pathway, you can stop IP3 receptors being activated, but then you can't recycle the inositol any further, you can't get it back down to inositol, and therefore you can't rejuvenate your PIP2 supplies, so eventually you're going to run out of PIP2 in these uh, neurons, and you're going to completely shut down all of these signaling cascades. Okay, that is what we know of what lithium does. It stops the GQ-11 mediated pathway. Okay, how that helps in bipolar disorder, whether it has anything to do with the reason that lithium helps in the bipolar disorder, I don't know. But that, I'm afraid, is all we know about what lithium does. It blocks the enzymes that turn inositol 1,4-bisphosphate into inositol 4-monophosphate and then the enzymes which turn inositol 4-monophosphate into inositol. Okay, and that stopping the production of the inositol then means that you can't rejuvenate your supplies of PIP2 in the cell membrane, okay, because you can't recycle the inositol because it's all trapped as this stuff here and therefore you kill the signaling pathway then. Okay, so that now concludes our discussion of depression and the antidepressant drugs.